Hey, folks, the Comedy Central Roasts are always one of the great comedy events of the year, and this year they're roasting Justin Bieber. The roast airs Monday, March 30th, but if you go to Comedy Central's Facebook page, you can see some previews now. They're also putting an exclusive red carpet pre-show and some of the other roasts from past years up for free in the Comedy Central app. Clear your calendar or set your DVR for Monday night. Kevin Hart, Jeff Ross, Natasha Leggero, Snoop Dogg, and others are roasting Justin Bieber. All right, let's do the show. All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers? What the fuck, buddies? What the fucking ears? What the fucksters? This is Mark Marin. This is WTF. This is my podcast. This is my show. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Welcome to the show. Some of you have been anticipating this show, this particular episode of this show. Kim Gordon of Sonic Youth will be on in a bit. Uh, Her book is out. Girl in a Band, it's called, available now in all book forms and all book shapes. Look, I just got back from New York City, and I've I've got to chill out. I've got... To chill out. I've not taken it easy since I got done shooting. I was in Rochester, as you know. Those were great shows. Um, then I went right to New York because I had some meetings to do. I had some people to see. And I apparently had some food to eat. Apparently, it's weird. My brain just starts knocking off things that I got to do. I, you know, I immediately went to Veselka upon arriving and had a bowl of borscht and four pierogies. And then later that night, I went there with Adam Goldberg. I don't want to drop names, but uh, we were hanging out. So Adam Goldberg and I go back to Veselka. I eat a bowl of borscht again. I eat four pierogies again. I eat kasha. So Adam Goldberg, he's on this meerkat thing, and he starts shooting this thing. He's got to shoot a thing that he said he was going to shoot for himself, and then it ended up he sh- shooting me and then me shooting him, and it was three and a half hours of us on that phone doing some live streaming thing for like 300 people. And it got pretty ugly. It got pretty ugly. I don't even know if you can still watch it. We had a nice dinner. We had a nice walk. We had a lot of laughs. We were having a good time. We went to the bar at the Bowery, ran into some horrible women, and a guy with a puppet. You know how you can tell when some people talk that they're just nasty fucked up people inside where where like you know whatever they're hiding or however you know, their tone and this was like uh, uh, you know sort of these these women were in TV one was a publicist and one was a producer for uh, news type shows and they were completely snotty and condescending didn't really have any idea who I was and uh, which is fine fine no problem most people don't know who I am but then, you know, the guy that they were with who had a puppet, we, and that's why I pulled him over there. I pulled, me and Adam were doing this dumb thing where we were streaming, and I saw a guy in the bar with two women, and he had a puppet. So I had him bring the puppet over, because I thought, like, this is funny and spontaneous. That guy's got a puppet. Maybe he'll come over. So the three of them come over. The guy's got no chops. He's got no puppet act. You know, he's just a guy with a puppet. He kept saying, this is Larry the Tranny or something. I kept saying, you know, Tranny's not a nice word to use. Uh... The, 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 it's a slang, it's, it's derogatory, and it hurts uh, their feelings. And the woman's like, uh, oh, sounds like, you know, you're, what are you, NPR? What are you, politically correct? And I'm like, what are you, some sort of latent conservative bitch? Like, you know, I, I said that out loud, and it was not good, because, you know, bitch in itself is a slang and derogatory. But it just struck me, this, the condescension, the assumption. Yeah, like, politically correct, one it's just, you know, be nice. If something is defined and and known to uh to marginalize and hurt someone's feelings and you know you be aware of it i wasn't even saying that i was telling the guy you know maybe you should not do that but then it's just like there's this tension i just saw the seething weird control freak anger just the condescending and the, you know just spit it out don't dance around it with all sorts of weird rage in your throat and guts that comes pounding through your face through your dumb eyeballs and in the slight lilt you know, in your voice of of who you are, sort of your your entire being is some sort of knot of uh, concealment until it comes out like, Gah! just like, Bleh! I've been lashing out a little. So 
I got to get some rest, got to get some clarity, got to get some focus, got to get some sober-minded shit going on. Been lashing out on Twitter. I had this, I've had a beef with a local pizza place over bullshit. Look, man, I like certain kind of pizza. And, and, and like, I, like I'm on Twitter and I'm like, I'm hung up on the crust. I go to New York, I get beautiful pizza at Joe's Pizza. I hold it in my hand, like what you fold it over, like a beautiful piece of New York sliced pizza where you can just fold it right in half before you even take a bite and the whole thing just is sturdy and beautiful, like a perfect piece of pizza, perfect slice. Fold that shit in half, and it doesn't fall the fuck apart and droop and slop and everything else. That's the way I like it. I'm crust-obsessed. But I don't need to tweet that picture to my local pizza place. I don't need to do that. I don't need to attack my fellow comics in roast wars that turn personal. I don't need to do it anymore. I'm done with it. But uh, I had a pretty nice time in New York because the weather was nice. All right, folks. Can I just say something? We've got a new sponsor today, and it's called Slack. Slack. What's the fastest way to communicate with people these days? You just send a message on your phone or your computer, correct? Right. But there are lots of ways to do that. Text, email, Twitter, Skype, Dropbox, Instant Messenger, and probably a couple of weird ones you never use, but they pop up on your phone anyway. Those are weird. Anyway, Slack is the way you can communicate with everyone without missing an important conversation just because you checked the wrong app. Today's episode is brought to you by Slack. Slack is great for teams at work. It brings all your work communications into one central place, makes everything instantly searchable, and it's available on any device. That easy search feature is important. You'll be able to find any conversation or any files, sync all your messaging systems, and even post animated GIFs, too. Or GIFs, or what are they called? More than 60,000 teams use Slack, including Airbnb, the New York Times, eBay, Yelp, and even the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory down the South Pole. No matter what your business is, Slack will work for you. Visit slack.com slash WTF to create a new team, and you'll get $100 in credit you can use when you decide to upgrade to a paid plan. Before upgrading, you can use Slack Lite with unlimited users as long as you like for free. So give it a spin with your team. Once you're impressed, you'll receive $100 in credit for upgrading just by visiting slack.com slash WTF. So I'm walking down the street in New York. Some guy just comes up to me, and he takes his headphones off, and he's standing there, and he's like, Hey, man, Mark Marin, I, I am, a, I, I've listened since the beginning. I'm a huge fan. It's so great to meet you. It's so great to meet you. Very earnest guy. I believe his name was Jay. Maybe been Jay Sin, but maybe Jay. And I'm like, How you doing, man? He's like, Great. I, I just can't believe I'm meeting you. I just want to tell you, I'm just, I'm just so happy for your success and that you're doing so well, and you know, I've followed you since the beginning. And it's just great. Just keep going, man. It's just so great to to be uh, to witness the whole process. And I'm like, well, thank you. And he says, uh, where are you going? I'm like, oh, I'm going over to this publishing house. It's like, great, that's great, you know. And he's, it's just, I'm just so, he's so he says he's so happy for me. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm just trying not to fuck it up. And he goes, you will, you will, you're gonna fuck it up. And I'm like, am I? He's like, oh, definitely, you're gonna, you're gonna fuck it up. But the great thing is, we'll all be there, we'll all be there with you when you fuck it up, and it'll be great, it'll be great. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's true, but, uh, but I like that he, he didn't change his tone, and there was the same type of confidence and excitement over uh, him in his mind, knowing that I will definitely fuck it up somehow, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be great because we're all gonna be hanging out and moving through that together. I, I can't completely say he's wrong, but uh, I, I feel all right. You know what I'm saying? The future of magazines is here, people. Next issue is the new newsstand, or maybe you want to think of it as a Netflix for magazines. It's the way to subscribe to all your favorite magazines with unlimited access for no monthly price. And you don't have to worry about the clutter of normal magazine subscriptions. You get everything on the Next Issue app, on any device or computer you want to use. What magazines pretty much all of them, Time, Newsweek, Wired, Sports Illustrated, People, Esquire, National Geographic, The New Yorker, Macworld, GQ, Us Weekly, Rolling Stone, Vanity Fair, Men's Health, Motor Trend, Popular Science, Entertainment Weekly, and over 120 more of your favorites. It costs less than two magazines from the newsstand to get a month-long subscription to Next Issue, and you get everything that's in the print issue, plus digital extras like videos, bonus photos, and interactive features. Look, you already listen to podcasts. This is how you get your audio. 
audio shows now. So make Next Issue the way you get your magazines. Go to nextissue.com slash Marin and sign up today for your first month free and 50% off Next Issue's popular premium plan for the next two months. This is a great deal, but it's only available in the U.S. by going to nextissue.com slash Marin and signing up today. That's nextissue.com slash Marin. So look, I got Kim Gordon. I, you know, I don't usually do this, but I, I did read most of her book and I, and I went back and listened to many Sonic Youth records, some I'd never heard before. And uh, I just wanted to be prepared, you know, for a lot of reasons, because, you know, I don't know that um, she's necessarily an easy interview. My uh, the woman I'm dating is a huge fan of hers. And Kim took her picture with her. And I think it was like one of the highlights of her life. But uh, let's listen now to my talk with uh, Kim Gordon of Sonic Youth. Her book is um, Girl in a Band, and it's out now. So, There's a lot of guitars there. I have a few. I'm not, you know, I'm just a, I'm, I don't know if I'm amateur, but I don't play with anybody. That was a gift. That's one of those Jay Maskus yeah, Squires. I recognize that. I have one of those. Too. You do? But your Jay probably gave you yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For my birthday. He's been here. He was here. I know. I heard his uh, interview. I was impressed. It was, it was impressive. Tough, right? You did a good job. It took a while. <laughs> I was, I was awesome. It wasn't until we started, he started uh, talking about his dad huh. and skiing and stuff. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, thank God. He's chatty. He is. Now that I've seen him a couple different places, yeah. like now it's okay. Yeah. So what video were you shooting? Uh, it's for um, this Peaches song called yeah. Close Up that I, uh, last year when I was here, they, or last summer, they invited me to come over and uh, lay something down. Which I did. How'd you get involved with it? Well, I've known her over the years, yeah. and then uh, this also this friend of mine, this kid, Vice Cooler. Well, yeah. I think of him as a kid because I met him when he and his brother when they were fifteen, and yeah. this band XRXBX. Yeah, they were touring around as like super young teenagers. Yeah, it was a super fast, super fast hardcore band. And I've just kind of seen him grow up over the years, and then suddenly he was involved with Peaches. Producing they, her record. And they want you to be in the video? Well, they wanted me to... Yeah, once I did the song, then I have to be in the video. You have to. <laughs> what was your part in the song? I hesitate to use the word hook, but yeah. when I went in there, it was just kind of like a minimal um, hip-hop track, mm -hmm. and I just put something down, and then um, he just built a rap around it, and they then they you know probably added other stuff. And well, That's cool. It. Yeah. It's. Uh, I was relieved that you grew up in L.A. because people come up here and they're they don't know where they are, oh, have yeah. any sense of what it is. And, yeah. And I I, I I got through. A, I, I read most of your book, which I don't usually do, but I need. <laughs> I was nervous uh -huh. oh, to really? talk to you. Yeah. Why? I don't know. I just. Uh, I don't know. I just got into my head that I didn't know enough about anything. Not not just you. Uh huh. But when I look at, you know, where you come from and what your interests are and the different worlds you were involved mm -hmm. in, I was like, I am not, I'm not up to speed. Uh -huh. So then like, you know, I'm, I'm Googling, you know, Glenn Branca and I'm seeing him for the first time mm -hmm. because of you, right. because I, I wanted to do, but it's kind of, it was kind of funny. I don't know if ironic is the right word, but I had to sit through a, a Michelob Ultra commercial before I watched <laughs> Glenn Branca do some kind of guitar solo. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, this is exactly what was supposed to not happen. This was the fight. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh, and then I watched, I watched the, uh, when you sang for the induction of Nirvana, you sang one of the songs, Aneurysm, right? Mm-hmm. And I remember watching that when it was on live and like being pretty broken up about it. And then, uh, like literally emotionally, uh, shattered. Mm hmm and then I watched it again this morning, and I cried again. Oh. What is that about? What was going on that day? Uh, it was very uh, touching. I mean, it was a very emotional... Actually, the sound check was really difficult, because suddenly they had these huge images of uh, Kurt's face up on the screen, and it was a bit... It was over, 
kind of overwhelming. But the whole night of the ceremony was so long and boring. <laughs> yeah. By the time I got up to <laughs> sing, just I was chomping like, at the bit. <laughs> yeah, and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't sad because I just wanted to do something, you know, so yeah. active. And um, I don't know, I was just trying to um, channel Kurt. I mean, I just to kind of see Chris and Dave after not seeing them and right. Pat and all these other people. Like, we had shared a lot of the same crew or right. in common and right. manager. And it was like a 90s reunion. Wow. In a way. Um, but it was such an odd, you know, surreal place to be at the Rock and Roll I can't Hall imagine. And, and all these kind of elder establishment. Yeah. People. Enemies, I would imagine, <laughs> from different points in your yeah, life. Enemies from punk rock. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Having been in the business so long, I, I have to assume that you walk into a room like that and you're like, oh, there's that fucker. Oh, uh, well, you know, not in a specific way. But, yeah. You know, just maybe there were some people I just didn't want to actually talk to who right. were, you know, would probably like, I don't know, hadn't seen since like the band broke up or right, Anderson right. broke up. So there were some people I was avoiding. Definitely. Just out of discomfort? Yeah. Yeah, it's horrible when you go through. That kind of want to, you know, give you their sympathy, but then draw it out. You know, they want (laughs) to draw the sadness into uh, into the open. Yeah, they can't help it. And it was such an emotional day anyway, so... um, And how fresh was the breakup at that point? Pretty fresh? I only recently got divorced a couple months ago, but... uh, I don't know. It was like a couple years, two and a half years. It's horrendous still, though, right? Yeah. It's an ongoing process that people uh, suddenly think it happens, like, as soon as they hear you're separated, and then it's over, and then, um, who are you dating? <laughs> or something. You, yeah, yeah, right, crazy. right. What do you go, how are you bouncing back? It's going to take, like, five years, ten years. Yeah. It's horrendous. I've been divorced twice. It's just the heartbreak is the worst. Yeah. It's just like there's nothing you can do to make it go away. I'm sorry, I'm not. Yeah, no, I mean, happy Valentine's Day, by the way. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I love that we're having this interview on Valentine's Day. Uh, We could discuss dating, broken-hearted people, dating, dating other, you know, like experiences. Are are you? Yeah. Is that right? Um, I don't know. I think um, I recently. Maybe broke up with somebody, or they broke up with me. Not sure. It's unclear. Well, yeah, it's unclear. <laughs> <laughs> it's not resolved. Like we're grown people. Maybe I'm going to see him today. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Well, that's. I'm glad. I'm dating a painter that's like a, a huge fan of yours to the point where oh, I was really? like, maybe you should. You know, she should come What's, in here. Who is it? Her name is Sarah Kane. I She's an abstract know. painter, and it's huh. a, like, and I've just recently been sort of back in that mm-hmm. world and trying to mm-hmm. understand it because I feel like I avoided it for so long. I was yeah. a comedian, but when I was in college, I was wanted to be an artist, but I didn't have what it took. Huh. Yeah, did some photographs. Yeah. But in your book, you're very candid about, certainly about the breakup, but also about like how the people that kind of built the way you saw the world. Mm-hmm. And, and, the, and you know, pri- a lot of men who had a profound influence on, on how you you know, see the world. And and starting, well, I guess, with your brother was the one you really kind of yeah. talked about a lot. And did you see him when you come out here? Yeah, some yesterday. How was that? Um, you know, it's always never lasts that long. And um, it was fine. Like, it's always good to just see him and see that he's doing the same, which is not... A- Oh, it's a fine, you know. <laughs> he's, he's properly medicated and level. No, I mean, he, you know, he was reciting this Dylan song, but he said he wrote it, you know, but he remembers the whole, all the words. He has an incredible memory for, for things like that. Well, there is sort of like a brilliance to schizophrenia, right? I think so. I mean, how did, did, when you guys were going up, he, no one really knew that was what was wrong with him. It doesn't kick in. No, so. yeah, he, it didn't really kick in until, like, his early 20s, I guess. And that's about the time, and, right? Yeah, and, um, you know, I think he was taking a lot of acid and... Exacerbated. There were a lot of people taking a lot of acid. <laughs> right. It's hard to figure out who was... Tripping online, and sick? Online, which, on which <laughs> side of crazy yeah. or... You know, right. Who was eccentric or... He was always an eccentric kid and... What was your relationship when you were kids? I looked up to him and he teased me 
more so, you know, like, I mean, every older brother, I'm sure, teases their right. sister, but I was super sensitive, and he was really overly critical, and um, it wasn't a good combination. And do you th- and you think that because I was a primary relationship, it kind of scarred you for life? Well, it made me um, just kind of want to hide my feelings. Yeah. Because I cried really easily. <laughs> really? Yeah. You know, and we had physical fights, too. But, I mean, when we were teenagers, we were friends. Yeah. And, um, you know, we smoked pot together. And yeah. Stuff. Was he ahead of you in terms of, like, what like what he liked? Like, did, did that have an influence on you? Oh, yeah. I mean, he read, um, you know, Nietzsche and Sartre and kind of turned me on to all these. And he got it? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I thought he had it, you know. And yeah. then, you know, but he was also really into Shakespeare and literature. He was wrote poetry and so um, he's like a unique guy yeah is your mom still alive or is it? no both my parents are my mom died in 2002 and my dad in 98 and your dad was a sociologist yeah in education at ucla and he but but like i see like this this is the problem with me reading the book because now i mm-hmm. know things yeah <laughs> and i'm gonna pry you know i'm gonna say it that way no, but I, like, I thought it was kind of interesting. <laughs> you know, like I'm sitting here telling you what your story is. But um, better you than, than I have to do it. Oh, really? Okay, I'll just I could just recite it all because I know I'll just go yes, and I know a lot about you. But I thought it was kind of fascinating that your father was the first to sort of catalog these high school mm-hmm. groups. Well, yeah, I mean, he did a you know social study. Yeah, uh, you know, as his thesis. Yeah, it was um, squares and socias and. Jocks, jocks. But there was no stoners, or but like no. And then my brother, when my brother was in junior high, he did his own, and it, then it was like surfers and essays. And, but, but your your old man was the guy who figured, like, sort of broke it down, huh? Yeah, it was. That's like one of the most important sort of distinguishing things in in, in our lives is to be mm-hmm. able to walk through a high school and go like, those are the stoners, yeah. those are the geeks, those are, and it like, yeah, it really exists. Yeah, I mean, it was probably this obvious thing, or yeah. I don't know, like. You know, that sometimes people don't say the obvious. And yeah. In your book, though, the one thing I noticed is that there's no mention of, of really learning how to play gu- guitar. Mm. <laughs> there's a reason for that. Really? Because <laughs> I didn't. No, you know, um, I was talking to, um, actually, I did an interview. Uh, Sally Timms from the Mekons interviewed me, and she'd been reading uh, Viv Albertine's book and and just talking about how punk rock was this thing that suddenly ignited a whole bunch of activity and sent one in a direction that you wouldn't necessarily have gone. Yeah. And, I mean, when I, you know, picked up a guitar or bass, it was definitely way post-punk, but it evolved into or, you know, helped develop what No Wave was and other, you know, just right. downtown kind of underground music. And so the spirit of it was also there, and it was really... It wasn't about learning how to play guitar. Right. I didn't notice it until after I read most of the book that, like, there usually when you read a musician or a band's book, there's that relationship that's built mm. with an instrument at some point. And it just wasn't, it was like, nope, it just sort of happened. Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, I feel stupid that I haven't read Viv's book, but I think she talks about how as girls in punk rock, they had a way different relationship to music and how they learn to play yeah i think a lot of boys learn to play in their bedrooms listening to records right or from other dudes or from other dudes yeah yeah. show me that thing like that's a nice lick (laughs) exactly (laughs) wait do that again (laughs) hold on is that it a lot of that but uh you knew you wanted to be an artist and now you've come have you come back around to visual arts yeah i mean since 2003 i've been pretty much painting Kind of doing installations or conceptually based painting. Uh, but like, was what? that the plan from early on? Because I mean, you spend a lot of time. Like, there's a lot of talk of dance. Uh huh. <laughs> well, I did also want to be a dancer as a when I was a teenager, but my mother sort of discouraged that. Why? Um, she just said it's a tough life, which is true. It is of any Super, of it. Yeah, I think dancers have it the hardest. Um, it's very specific. Yeah. But I'm also not into anything really conventional. So, um, like the music I was drawn to was not conventional music. Or 
But even yeah. early on, I mean, you talk like uh, well, no, yeah, I mean, I, the records I listened to growing up was, but I mean, this when I went to uh, as far as when I was in New York and I first saw No Wave bands, I just thought, wow, that's amazing, and I think I can do that. <laughs> right. Well, when did that start to <laughs> it was break? Because it's so much free. Yeah. When did that start to break apart, though? Like, I mean, in your mind, like I know from the book, I can't. I just can't even imagine what it was like to grow up in L.A. in the '60s. It must have been mm. amazing. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was, I guess. Um, it was definitely, uh, you know, less crowded, you know. Uh, well, to know, like, to know that many people that might have met Charles Manson, it must have been oh, a much yeah. more intimate landscape. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It was um, odd. Like, I didn't really like living here, or I wasn't really that. It was this kind of existential nausea of, like, <laughs> yeah. the sun shining the same every day. Or, right. But well, you seem to have found some beauty in it as time went yeah, on. Yeah, I know, definitely. I, I mean, I, it's my favorite place to look at things and, yeah. um, visually how the idea of self-expression, it becomes um, how you customize everything from your house to your car to... Right. Um, Hot rod culture, too. Yeah, and I find, you know, it's all so kind of visually interesting and the, and it was sort of fascinating to me that you there's these people in your lives that are big people and, and that a lot of us all know that sort of kind of resurface in your life later right I mean it's it's very odd to me but I guess it's really not that odd that Danny Elfman and you went to school together and that you had mm-hmm. this relationship but he's his own thing too mm-hmm. and you guys got very close when you were in high school yeah do you still talk to him I haven't I mean I've run into him a couple times yeah. and um a friend of mine plays uh volleyball or something in yeah. his house once a week. <laughs> He's got a game of some kind going on. Uh, how, how, you, how did he factor into your whole sort of like uh, the way you saw yourself at that time or how was he sort of pivotal? I don't know. Like he was really kind of the first um, real boyfriend where, you know, we actually talked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he was pretty supportive for a while or, like you know, like he... I don't know, like, he just sort of believed that I would always be an artist or I could be successful. Did you think he was talented then? Yeah, he was very talented. He was a totally untrained, talented person. You know? Yeah. Like, I didn't know where he suddenly he was doing music, and it started with uh, Oingo Boingo as a street theater. He actually did it on the street? Yeah, they had kind of like a marching <laughs> kind of band. His older <laughs> brother, and who was married to this beautiful French woman, Yeah. Marie, and... Um, They'd been in the Magic Circus together in Paris. And that's where it started? Yeah, it was kind of like uh, they did like old jazz and um, St. Louis blues and all this kind of work costumes. It was more in like theatrical in a circus way. It wasn't new. It wasn't new wave. It was new wave. Was that even, is it happening yet? New wave? No, it yeah. wasn't. But, um, but was it crazy yeah. here? Like in the, like, like what, in 69, you were like, what, 16 or 15? Yeah, and, and it was just, and then the seventies just got all dark and weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sixty nine was a weird year. Yeah, yeah. Did you do much drugs? I did some acid, but yeah. I didn't do like tons. Yeah, I mostly like smoked pot, I guess. Did you ever go up to San Francisco much? Oh yeah, I used to go up there when um when I was fifteen. There was a flight you could take for like ten dollars, the yeah. last flight, and I stayed with friends of my parents. I could go to the Fillmore. Um, Who'd you Avalon see? Ballroom. Um, I saw Moby Grape, um, oh, yeah. Jefferson Airplane. Yeah, at the original Fillmore. Yeah. Did you like those bands? Oh, yeah, definitely. So you liked all that? You liked I the liked, hippie yeah, music? Yeah, I was totally into that. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had those records. When you knew you were going to be an artist, or this idea set in, like, who was... Was it because of the trip to New York or when you went to art school in Toronto? When was there a moment where you're like, this is... Because it's such... Like, I started to think about it myself. It's such an insulated, unique life mm-hmm. that has its own language and its own people. Right. And, like, I... That was one of the insecurities I had mm-hmm. about talking to you. It's like, you know, I know a lot of you know artists, but I don't mm-hmm. know... Like, this is a very specific bunch mm-hmm. that you ran with. Right. And it wasn't really a music thing. No. Uh-uh. And until it, you made it one. Mm-hmm. So when you were like a, at York University, was that where you started to sort of like make decisions around music? Not really. It. Um, I mean, I, we had this band, but it wasn't serious. We made it up for um, our media class, uh-huh. um, and we were just bored, so we just yeah. did that. But 
but it, I, I guess it gave me a taste for performing. Um, but I still, when I moved to New York, it was really to be a visual artist. And then when I met Dan Graham and yeah, tell me about that. He guy. asked me, uh, <sighs> he's a pretty eccentric artist. Uh, he's a sculptor. Um, he's a conceptual artist uh-huh. who now he makes a lot of, um, pavilions that are, you know, he's interested in architecture and they have, uh, materials like two-way glass. He's mm-hmm. really into voyeurism, actually, and mm-hmm. things like that. Your relationship with him was long, right? I mean, you... Yeah, well, I lived, um, he lived upstairs for me, so... Um, so he sort of was your guide, kind your of, portal, yeah, yeah. when you got to New York. But you met him in California, right? I met him, yeah, at CalArts at a lecture. And your parents were kind of hipsters, weren't they? Um, They were just, they weren't conventional. They were academics. They had friends who were more bohemian. Mm-hmm. They were more into security, I guess. Well, yeah. You know, coming out of the Depression. And but they were still like in, within the college environment. Yeah, and they were super you know, supportive of uh, creative endeavors and that sort of thing. But it took them a long time to realize your brother was in trouble. Yeah. Because probably they thought, well, maybe he's just odd. Yeah, and they just, from their generation, they didn't believe in psychiatry or... You know, it was like if you had a problem, you just had to deal with it yourself. And um, Right. Do you have any of that in you? I mean, only in the last three years, you know, I, did I <laughs> go into therapy. <laughs> so, yeah, you do. <laughs> but I also realize I, I go around thinking of myself as this really traditional sort of middle class grounded person. And you- I am a grounded person, but I... I I don't, that's not my life really, or what I do is, I guess, more bohemian. Or, You've always felt that? I realize that I carry, so carry this idea of myself and that, um, maybe also when, um, you know, having a daughter, I wanted to almost overcompensate and have this really stable environment that was um, almost so square, you know, yeah. in the house. Yeah. In a but certain you, way, but it wasn't. But right. it, I don't know. I just um, but, I realized, why do I think of myself like that? <laughs> I'm actually not like that at all. <laughs> but I have that in me, you know. Right. But you that's where I came from. Did that happen? Uh, really, sort of. It must have just happened after you had the baby, right? I think I always, you know, when I moved to New York, I was always like, God, I'm just so conventional. You know, middle class. It's just so fucking like. <laughs> really, I'm never going to be punk rock. But you're so punk rock. <laughs> I mean, I think for a whole generation of people, you're like it. No, but, you're but better my, than but punk rock. But my whole thing was like, um, it's good just to be yourself. You know, it's like, why? I'm not going to make some persona like Susie Sue or Lydia. You know, but that's you not who to, I am. You know what I yeah. mean? It's like, I'm not goth girl. But you had to make decisions like that, and you seem to come up with your own thing. Yeah, just. but I think that was part of the, you know, the hardcore movement was really... Uh, just about being more, you know, like yourself in a way, you know. So when you first get to New York, it's what, 1980, 81? Yeah, 1980. And you're living down the Lower East Side. Mm-hmm. And like I I moved there in 89 and it was the just starting to sort of like clean up or whatever the mm-hmm. hell that was. There was still a lot of dope around and stuff. But I, I imagine at that time, it must have been insane. Like it's just yeah. chaos everywhere. Well, it was very, you know, downtown was a lot. Of, it was kind of deserted, yeah. you know. Tribeca totally right. and, and um, Soho you know it was dirty and you know the money the, the city was pretty bankrupt and and what was your plan when you got there um I don't know just to kind of see shows and make connections with you know maybe try and find a gallery but I was pretty intimidated by what was your that. medium at that time <laughs> Uh, my medium was m- more conceptual, and in fact, I started doing kind of interventions in people's apartments. What is that? <laughs> but, <laughs> that was <laughs> <laughs> like a kind of psychological interior designer. Oh, really? Yeah, like How'd... altering something physically and then making a piece of um, art that sort of reflected something about the person. Oh, give me an example. I asked Dan if I could do something in in his apartment okay. and um Dan Graham. Yeah, which is was a typical railroad apartment, right. bathtub in the kitchen. Yeah. And uh so he didn't cook at all, so I got rid of his stove yeah. and uh <laughs> I put I put this uh 
rubber Pirelli tile down on the floor that he had always admired that was inside um, bank foyers. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of like Italian kind of flooring. Uh-huh. And, um, and then I um, did a watercolor of Debbie Harry uh-huh. from Blondie because he was a huge fan. Yeah. On a piece of um, typewriter paper or something. Anyway, so that's what... And then I wrote about it and got it published in a magazine. And that was the piece? Yeah. And you did several of those? I did a few of them. I didn't do that many. So the arc of it was you you go into somebody's environment, you mm-hmm. sort of take or leave something of their life and yeah. make some alterations, <laughs> yeah. and then write about it in an art magazine. Yeah. And yeah. So, but how do you get, really get a, a gallery with that? Um, you, <laughs> you don't. <laughs> It was just like, kind of an alternative to that. But, yeah. I mean, eventually, I mean, I had a show at this alternative space. Which one? White Columns, which coincidentally, I had a survey show there a year ago, last oh, fall. Oh, really? It was in a different location. Full circle. Full circle, yeah. It's interesting to me that, because I, I went to some of those shows when when I was younger. I know what in- installations are, and I know that the woman I'm, I'm with now does installations, but I always wondered, like, what... Like, and there was a moment there when D- where Dan Graham tells you not to get locked into a gallery, you know, into that arc of a painter because there's nowhere else to go from there. That you want to create a conversation, mm-hmm. some sort of right. discourse with the culture. Yeah. Did did that? What was your idea of art uh, outside of just you know being young and understanding mm-hmm. the, the context of 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 the world you were working in? What what did you want to do? What what did you think the purpose of it was? Hmm. Well. Kind of, it's sort of an intellectual conversation, right? Um, with o- objet mm-hmm. <laughs> or not, but I, I don't know. I think it's um, just you know something that reflects something about the culture in a way, but also has a whole dialogue with kind of the history of art as an object, and you know, and, and just all the different sides of it. So, yeah, it's, it's it's completely self-referential and 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 constant. That it's almost like it's like philosophy. It keeps building on itself. Yeah, it's a language, right? Yeah. Until uh, until somebody keeps, you just got to keep blowing it up, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's the idea. Like waiting for the new guy to blow up the art thing. But then you talk a lot about the eighties and just how it it was on. It, you couldn't differentiate it between that art had sort of, for art's sake, had died, and that the business world had mm-hmm. co-opted it. Well, I mean, you know, I think Wall Street was booming and um, well, there was a generation of artists and they said, well, we're not doing that. You know, we're going to make it up ourselves, our own way. Right. And they went back to sort of object making and kind of fetishized objects. And and then suddenly, like, painting and objects were like, that's what everyone was doing of the new generation. They called it picture generation. Or- so when you, were, when you started writing about um, music and finding your way into music. I mean, you had to reckon with a lot of like, you know, big sort of dude personalities where you sort of like, I, and I know that you, you wrote specifically about rock guys, didn't you for a little while? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and somehow or another that helped you enter that world. I don't know. Maybe I was looking for a better relationship with a brother type. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I remember as a little girl looking at my dad's books, like something called Men at Work. Like, what is that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, then I just wrote some article about, I don't know, I was always trying to write kind of faux intellectual things, make s- some ridiculous premise and then try and prove it. And <laughs> yeah. so. So it was a joke? One was kind of a, yeah, <laughs> male, yeah. Bo- you know, about male bonding. Right. Um, and these were, yeah. but those were, those were satires. They weren't real criticisms. Well, it wasn't like they were, they were real criticisms, but it was, um, I don't know what's the most extreme thing I can write that's still considered intellectual or something. Or right, right. Maybe I'm not intellectual, but I kind of was playing around with that. You didn't feel like you were intellectual? So I thought I'd write about male sexuality. <laughs> Uh, As a woman, yeah. Like, did that make waves? Did you did you get some attention for those writings? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, yeah. it was definitely the only thing I really did more publicly the, uh, before art making. It's so funny to me that like you met Larry Gagosian. Is that mm-hmm. how he says his last name on the street? 
in Westwood? Yeah. When you were a kid almost? Well, I was like um, 18 or And he was 19. selling garbage prints? Yes. And I worked for him framing hundreds of those. Hundreds. It's just so flukish, isn't it? I, and I wear it. You can't make this stuff up. It's right. Weird. And then he turns out to be the biggest art dealer in the world. Mm -hmm. And then you work for him again. Yeah. But that was your inn in New York. Yeah. Oh, my God. And of course, you remembered you, right? Yeah. I mean, I worked more for Anina, his um, partner in yeah. the, the non-commercial space. But yeah. And then I eventually had a show with him last spring or whenever it was. Right. Recently. What was in that show? Yeah. Um, it was a series of paintings using um, a wooden wreath as a mask, mm -hmm. a masking device, and then spray painted. Oh, you know, nice. So that you take it off, and then you have this sort of ghost image of the wreath. Uh huh. And uh, you know, I wanted to um, find something that was pretty suburban, or like you could get at Home Depot, and then kind of transform oh, yeah. into this more. Um, or not? Maybe they do look tacky, <laughs> but I, <laughs> I uh, had a show in this Schindler House up on top of Mul Mulholland where I made the paintings in the basement, and I was into the idea of staging. Mm -hmm. It was like home, like, like house like, porn shows, and yeah, how like real estate agents do it. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I was kind of, you know, into that. Uh huh. And it came out good. Yeah, it was super fun. So. When you first saw the No Wave bands, who was the first one you saw? When, 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 that, when did that moment happen? Where did it happen where you're like, oh, shit, this um, is it? I don't remember. It might have been at some place called Franklin Furnace. or mm -hmm. I really can't remember who you, it was. Oh, you don't? It, it was... Because uh, I missed... I just missed all that. So it was... Yeah. Like the, the very idea of them was to not be identifiable as a movement or as a sound. Well, I don't know. I don't think people really thought about it, but... Um, there was a compilation that was put out uh, that Brian, someone brought Brian Eno to this artist space event where all these bands were playing. And yeah. he ended up kind of cherry picking certain bands to be on this record. And then it kind of got other people's noses out of joint and sort of broke up the community <laughs> spirit yeah. of right. or, what, what little there was. I mean, um, and then other people. When I got to New York, pretty much most of it was over. I saw Mars. I saw DNA. Was Suicide still around? Suicide was still around. That was amazing. That was one of the first shows I saw. It's pretty it was wild, incredible. Right? Yeah. Um, what was, like, yeah. What, I could, like I just got into him fairly recently because I'm always late to the mm -hmm. party. What was it about that guy? He was just scary. You know, he'd go out into the audience and uh, just go right up to you and. Um, it was hot. It was just chilling. It yeah. was so minimal, but um, he was haunting. His, yeah, he was haunting. Yeah, I like when I watched him. I was like, yeah. "Oh shit!" I just like never seen anything like that. And you saw it live. Yeah. So it was really. Oh yeah. And you and at that time, so like oh, well, all that stuff. So what 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 provoked you to get started with it? Um. Well, Dan had this. Uh, Dan Graham had a this performance oh. piece where he would have a mirror behind him and then he would just look out into the audience and describe the audience and then he would turn around and describe himself with the audience behind him mm -hmm. and his gestures and so he wanted to do that with an all-girl band because he was writing articles about all-girl bands and the slits and um, he asked me if I wanted to make up a band for this piece. Mm -hmm. And so, and I, inter he introduced me to this girl, Miranda, who was a bass player, and this other girl, Christine Hahn, who played drums with, uh, Glenn Bronca's band at the time, The Static. So we, uh, and I played guitar, so we wrote these songs, um, and took lyrics. I took lyrics from, uh, women's magazines, mm -hmm. like, Cosmopolitan girl. They had a whole text on the back, mm -hmm. like I'm a cosmopolitan girl, yeah. and <laughs> yeah, blah blah blah. So it was almost like a talking blues thing, right? And you know, another one was just ad copy about separates. Yeah, I don't know, just softball yeah, separates yeah, yeah. and lipstick. Right. And anyway, so we we um, made some songs and we did this performance. We were supposed to, after a song, have some 
kind of interaction with the audience. Yeah. But we didn't really know exactly what he wanted us to do. And, uh, we were also so nervous. Like, um, I think Christine just got up during her turn and went to the bathroom and came back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he was kind of like pissed. Like he didn't think it was successful. And, but I kind of thought it was like people, For you, nobody knew what was going on. Right. Anyway. It was kind of, I think just making people, taking him out of a conventional audience performer situation mm-hmm. was always sort of interesting. And I think that's what people were, also drawn to about Kurt because like he just took it w- way far you know, right as far yeah as yeah like uh, and same with Iggy yeah and Ig- uh, yes of course Iggy, yeah 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 he was definitely amazing so that so that's what you felt that first time it's interesting that you know it was a manufactured sort of event mm-hmm. by this dude yeah right right <laughs> who, uh, yeah who just had this yeah big and then idea. we didn't do what it, you know, it was kind of manipulative we didn't do you know what we were was he a lechy guy do. No. No, that's good. <laughs> you just had some big ideas? Yeah. I mean, I think he had a... Yeah, he had some big ideas, but... No, I mean, you know, it was kind of interesting what he was trying to do. Uh, I think he was trying to activate a woman's... You know, instead of a woman traditionally being a, in a passive position where people project stuff onto mm-hmm. them and... Um, that we would be active in mm-hmm. some way, and although we were already playing, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so, but something about crossing back into that barrier, or you right? Know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's like really similar to um, maybe being a stand-up comic in yeah. a certain way, a stand-up. Yeah, I, it's a, it's a very weird thing because I know in the in the book there was a little piece about Chappelle and that uh-huh. that event. It's it's very the space. That you can choose to occupy, you know, as an artist of any kind. It really is. It's up to you. Right. And you can sit in it in whatever discomfort you want for Mm -hmm. however long you want to do it. Sometimes I resent the audience. Sometimes I resent that they're expecting something from Mm -hmm. me. Sometimes, uh, you know, I feel like, oh, we're all great. We're all one mind. And then other times you want to make them pay for something. Yeah. Do you have those feelings? Oh, yeah, definitely. I think it's similar to, (laughs) uh, you know... Yeah. But that's just me. Some sure. guys just go tell jokes. Yeah. I mean, it's an easy way to do things. Right, right. But it's not, it's not your way, mm-hmm. right? It's not my way. Yeah. I mean, there seems to be an almost active resentment of the easy way to do anything. Mm-hmm. Do you have that still? A little bit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I like doing the, this improv duo I have with Bill Nace. Um, you know, it's just two guitars and vocals, and it's really fun, and but it's scary because I we go out and we don't really have anything planned. <laughs> right. You know, we make it up every night and yet we know how each other plays and so it seems like a band. Where do you of. do that at? Um, well, we just did three shows here. One at the Getty, one at the Echo and one in Orange County. Oh, yeah? We went to Australia. We were in a couple festivals. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I mean, we've done touring in Europe and we put a record out last fall oh a year ago last fall in matador okay that was really surprisingly well Wait, what's it called <laughs> it's called coming apart i'm <laughs> <laughs> good we we have we play with um film behind us in slow motion that right it's so slow that it kind of implies there's a narrative of some kind but you don't really it doesn't ever evolve into anything when you started playing with uh with with the band, with with w- the original Sonic mm-hmm. Youth, well, you met Thurston was in another band. Yeah, he was in a band called The Coachman. Yeah, that mm-hmm. my friend Miranda took me to see. Were they a good band? They were okay. They had the jangly guitar thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Kind of more new wave ish sort of. Were you anti new wave? Rock. Yeah, yeah. Riz- Riz- oh, is that what they called it? Rizzy Rock. Yeah. Is that what they were from Rizzy. Heads? Yeah. Yeah, that school. Yeah. Um, Did you like any of those guys? Did you like like Verlaine or any of oh, them? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, Burn, yeah. not so much. Um, early Talking Heads, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So were they around? They were just no. They weren't. I mean, they were famous by, by then. You know, by the they time were, you got there, yeah. Interesting. I mean, Thurston saw all those bands in the late seventies. Right from Connecticut. He's a Connecticut kid. Yeah, he's gonna take the train into the city or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, you meet him at that show. Yeah. And that was the last show of his band, actually. 
that you saw. That was like yeah, that was their last show. It was just ending, and it wasn't me. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you had nothing to do. And with then uh, he was also he was playing with this girl Miranda. I mean, uh, Anda Marinus, who was Vito Acconci's girlfriend at the time. So I started playing with those with them. Yeah. And um, after Thirst Night, so it got together, and we had a she was a keyboard player, and we had a series of different drummers, and changed our names, and finally arrived at this name Sonic Youth and it was kind of like then we sort of realized we didn't really want to play with a keyboard player anymore and we just sort of parted ways from her and met Lee right you know we knew Lee he was around and Thurston put on this festival at White Columns the Noise Fest because there's nowhere to play for bands so it became like a 10 day long bands just kept asking to play specific kinds of bands or any band? it was really kind of a wide range you know it was i mean people downtown it wasn't um so punk was, was it? over kind of yeah punk was definitely over and cbgb's was kind of starting to be over well cbs was still going but hurrahs had closed and i think tier three had closed uh-huh. I, I interviewed thurston once and it was like it was embarrassing it was at, when I hosted an evening show here. And I, and I, like, he, we were trying to talk. I was trying to talk about noise mm-hmm. bands, but I didn't know any noise uh-huh. bands. I knew none. Well, it was weird. I mean, that was a term. Actually, that was a derogatory term at that right. time. Um, like the owner of Haraz said, well, all these bands just sound like noise. Right. So um, no one really liked that term. So it just, it, we sort of took it as this right. thing. But right. um, it was definitely derogatory. So it wasn't a real movement. Not really, you know. There was, there was, um, like John Zorn and the improv thing going on. Where were they? At that but there pack? weren't any knitting factory guys. Like it was pre knitting factory. Zorn's out there, man. That's pretty wild shit, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, he comes out of the new music yeah. composition and jazz and. But wasn't that like kind of heady? Yeah, but we weren't really like at that time. There was no real clear movement. There was like the Swans and us and Live Skull and. There just didn't feel like we didn't fit in. Right, with and, anybody. Yeah. And um, there was like the Hoboken pop scene with the individuals and mm-hmm. the bongos and that they were like the ones that were popular. And It's kind of this middle zone. Yeah. Now, you guys kind of owned it. But who did you tour with first? Um, well, we just toured with ourselves. I mean, we brought along um, Dinosaur Jr. when they were on one tour. They were touring in a station wagon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They were really young, and they opened for you. Yeah, so they so but oh so the tours where you open for larger acts didn't happen till later. No, we didn't. That was nothing we were interested in at all. At the like, beginning, we were not interested. Yeah. Well, we were never interested in it except we were happy to do it when Neil asked us to do it. When of Neil course, yeah. yeah. But uh, we weren't. You know, we were never really into that. What were you into? What was the idea? <laughs> it was really baby steps. You know. Yeah. Getting a gig at CBGB, right. then making a record, then going on tour. And how did you evolve the sound? I mean, you guys would just sit there and, and, and work it out because there's, you know, the mm-hmm. dissonant sound and like the mm-hmm. guitar is tuned weird. Uh-huh. And then, you know, <laughs> there's some droning going on. Mm-hmm. I mean, how did you know when you clicked it, when it was, when it was happening? <laughs> um, did you just question. sit there for, yeah? You know, <laughs> I don't, well, we liked things that were contrasted, like a melody line and then dynamics, you know, right. things that got loud, things mm-hmm. that got soft. And I don't know, it was like we just kind of really played it, kind of formed it organically as Cause it's, the arrangements. Because it's interesting, like, it's un, it's a completely definable sound that you guys repeated, mm-hmm. you know, that you have, a, like, Sonic Youth sounds like Sonic Youth and mm-hmm. no one really sounds like you. So, you know, it mm-hmm. it must have felt, there must have been a groove achieved that kept uh-huh. kind of growing. You knew when you hit it, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess so, yeah. yeah. What was that Neil Young tour? When was that? What album had come that out? That was, uh, that must have been after Goo, our first major label uh, debut. It's wild to me that real bands that, you know, people that are in it for the long haul mm-hmm. and have a defined sound, mm-hmm. you can hear it in the earliest music. Do you ever mm-hmm. listen to that stuff? Sometimes, you know, it's weird. Sometimes I'll walk into a store or someplace and I'll hear something. I'll go, God, that sounds so familiar. <laughs> and I go, oh, shit. I put the fucking MC5 on when it, when Wayne Kramer came over. <laughs> like, he was walking up the driveway, and they've only got three records out. Oh, man. And he's playing, and I'm like, you recognize that? He's like, I don't. 
he did, he did not, could, did not know. And he walked in, he didn't know. That's funny. I don't know. Like, I definitely can hear a tuning. You know, I can tell right. it's us because of the... Yeah, it's very, it's a yeah. specific dissonance, right? Yeah. yeah, it's just some, you know, not that other people don't use different tunings in their guitars, but something about the uh, the tone and, yeah. And when you, the, well, I mean, I know that obviously what's happened with you and Thurston has happened, but mm-hmm. when it was good, did you, you guys loved playing, right? I mean, and Lee, yeah. too, like all that drummer, too. Steve. It's crazy. Yeah, he's a great drummer. He's a great drummer. Yeah. And you all got along for the most part? For the most part, you know, I mean, there's always little band dynamics. But, um, you know, the older we got, I think we, I thought we were learning how to get along better. Yeah. Did you have any idea? It's really hard when you're a democracy and then you're all trying to mix a record. You know, I think when we found people that we all felt good working with, that was much better, you know. You're very candid about the dissolving of the relationship in the Mm -hmm. book. And I, I wrote a book about my divorce, and it's it's very cathartic to do that, and it feels good. But when you when when you write that stuff, when you talk about the specifics of it, mm-hmm. do you do it to purge yourself or to help others, or you know, it's just part of your story? <laughs> to help others, I <laughs> I think. Well, for me, it's writing as it's partly. I can't think unless I'm writing, or mm-hmm. I can't figure out how I'm feeling about something. And when something like that happens to you, that's so kind of spins you off and you start looking back at your whole life. Like, how did I get to where I am? And I right. couldn't really um, figure out where I am now right. unless I did. And, you know, I, I tried to be as minimal about it as I could. When I went through it and even talking about you were very diplomatic about your parents and about mm-hmm. you, 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 there's no, but you didn't really completely throw anybody under the bus. And, oh. uh, it's hard not to. I mean, when I wrote my book, I, you know, my my father went right under the bus. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I. It, I'm older than you, more mature. Is that it? Is that <laughs> what? He's still around, and I caught a lot uh-huh. of shit about it. Uh-huh. I don't know how my ex feels about it, but I tried to be. Yeah. It's very hard because. Well, I'm sure that some people will be bummed out about my book. You know, but. Yeah. I don't know. No. You write, here's what this thing you said. I wonder whether you can truly love or be loved back by someone who hides who they are. It's made me question my whole life and all my other relationships. Yeah. That kind of blew my mind. I highlighted it. <laughs> Look at that shit. <laughs> shit is highlighted, Kim. The thing like that, that kind of spun me out because then I'm thinking about art and about what uh-huh. you're really digging it for. And is it some sort of something that has to happen in the present that's completely different and mind blowing? Or is it some kind of truth you're looking for? And then when you come up with something like that. Isn't that what it does when you lose your identity? Like your identity is so wrapped up with another person. And that person is also part of your work and your income and yeah. your everything. Yeah. Why? Well, that's a and unique then, situation. Uh, yeah. So um, it just... Like, obviously, no matter what someone does, it is two two people who right. create a situation. So, um, you know, I just sort of wanted to examine myself and see h- how I contributed or didn't or whatever. Right. And then you were wary to use words like codependent <laughs> uh-huh. and narcissist. Well, I don't know. They seem so therapy talk, but... Uh, <laughs> right. Uh I don't know, you know, like it, it, um, it's like someone can be a narcissist or have, you know, we're all somewhere yeah, on the spectrum sure, sure. of that. And, right. um, but then there is like something like narcissist disorder or, right. There's a difference between border, having narcissist or like a toxic borderline. Ooh, or, scary stuff. That is. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. but you know, uh, beyond that, like it's true. You really can't help who you fall in love with if, right. if you believe you're in love or, you know, and people do change, and it, whether they change because they've repressed a big part of who they are, or and I have to say, I'm sure I was stuck in the whole thing too. My marriage, you know, I was not. It's kind of brought me, made me free, <laughs> yeah, and allowed me to basically get back to where I feel like. Uh, I should what I should be doing, you know, making art and mm-hmm. things that are really um, inherent and authentic to you, primary to who I am, and that I actually like 
put that on the back burner is kind of upsetting to me. Right. You know? uh, in retrospect. Yeah, in retrospect. Well, I guess it, like, I, I don't know what drives a, a band, but I guess the compulsion to just keep working is a lot of mm-hmm. it, right? Sure. And it's kind of like a machine. It just like keeps going, you know? Yeah. And how, and he was like, I don't know, he's a little older than me. I mean, I, it's, it's so weird, I guess. And, and I, I can understand what you're saying before about how, you know, feeling like middle class or, or mm-hmm. conventional is like, it, it isn't, it's not an unusual tale. Mm-hmm. Right. You know? For sure. It's right. It's so, it's just, it's just, yeah, what's, it's, it's how nothing pe- special. I mean, it happens to so many people. Right. It's how people yeah. fuck up. Yeah. God damn it. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I've known, you know, since then I've met, you know, several couples or friends whose marriages have completely fallen apart. And, um, you know, and then they're reading my book and they're just like relating to it. And right. It's, it's strange. Well, it's, it's such, and, and also I think that the idea of how technology leaves this, like all this, it, it, like that, that feeling that you had where, it was almost like he was just dying to be caught. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I right, right, right. Because right. I know that when my first marriage broke up and I was the bad guy, you know, it it just mm-hmm. you you're a coward, and mm-hmm. then you get caught. Right, and then you're kind of relieved in a way or something. Well, yeah, something, but then, but it didn't. See, but then you kind of want your cake and you want to eat it too, and you want to, mm-hmm. you right. know, you want to sure. be a child. And yeah, you want, you want a, everything to be okay. You want, yeah, yeah. You don't want to be oh, looked at as a bad person. Or, it's horrible. Yeah. Like the heartbreak of it is just like I definitely related to it. Yeah. And uh, and do you think um, outside of this of, of this writing, as you sort of you know take um, reown yourself or whatever, uh-huh. what are you, are you gonna? Do you feel like some of this pain is informing? Other than the performance I saw on the on the mm-hmm. Rock and Roll Hall uh-huh. fan, which it was devastating to me. Uh-huh. Do you feel that you're gonna purge yourself even more with this stuff? Um. I don't know. I mean, I, right now I feel okay. <laughs> oh, yeah? Good. Good. That's but, good. Um, you know, I'm, there's obviously, I haven't been so busy, so, you know, it's times when you're not busy that you can feel sad or, Ugh. but I, I've had so many, uh, amazing things happen to me since then and, um, you know, so many great things going on and, um, I don't know. It's pretty amazing to watch, um, like when I watched some of this stuff, because I was rewatching things of you guys playing and and you know you covering like it's like Iggy songs and then mm-hmm. like just these moments where you guys are all there's something you wrote in the book about just dodging guitars that y'all you, mm-hmm. you were in it but then on the periphery you just right <laughs> see yeah. guitars coming at you yeah another thing that you talked about that I found compelling and I could relate to is this perpetual sense of not doing enough of insecurity of maybe feeling like a a fraud. Of some kind artistically, do you still get that? Um, well, I'm sure some people feel like I should just play music and not make art or something. Uh huh. <laughs> um, and some people think I should play conventional songs, or I don't know, you know, people get weird ideas about you. Could you ever play conventional songs? No. I, I mean, see. this writing this book is probably the most conventional thing I've ever done. So. And it's very straightforward. Yeah. Because I was reading some of the uh, some of your essays because I got hold uh-huh. of another book uh-huh. uh, of the essays oh, yeah. and it's different. Like mm-hmm. I like this book is very kind of like close to the bone. Yeah, I mean I like I mean parts of it were really boring to write. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> just like having the nuts and bolts of talking about things that you feel like you've talked about yeah. in interviews or just have I to. Know. Can I just Wikipedia yeah, what yeah. the raincoats sound like? Right or something. Yeah, just put that in scope. You know, Google. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, I liked writing about L.A. and early New York, and you know, certain things were fun to write about. Yeah, and your daughter too. I mean, like yeah. that that bit where you watch her for the first time—that got yeah. me choked up. I just cry. Yeah. How's she doing? She's good. She um she goes to the Chicago Art Institute. Wow. Third year student and has a great boyfriend. Cool. Has a, and she's, she's known since high school, but they. They weren't together then, but yeah, and it worked out. Yeah, he's a really good musician, actually. And she's gonna go the music route. No, she's an artist. Oh yeah, painter. Yeah, it's. Uh, do you feel ecstatic about that? Oh yeah, I'm thrilled. <laughs> I mean, I love her. She's so like 
<laughs> one of you know my favorite people to hang out with. And she's so cool. That's so sweet. Yeah. Well, look, I, I I hope I did did justice to our conversation. Yeah, I mean it's Valentine's Day. I thought maybe <laughs> what <laughs> we could trade uh, dating experiences. Okay, I'll think, well, let's see. Or do you have any advice for me, as somebody oh, who's my like? God. I um. Well, I'm dating this painter now, which is all new thing because she's like completely consumed, like artists are mm-hmm. in her art, and uh, I'm not used to that type of detachment. I'm a little needy. I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a good dater. Yeah. I don't really know how to do it. Yeah. I was married twice, and like I know, I don't know that. And certainly, you've been in in a certain type of limelight long enough to where it becomes very difficult to date when you're a public person. Right. And 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 people know you. Yeah. So you have to almost look for these people that are going to pretend like they've never heard of you before, or else date in your pool. Yeah. I don't know. It depends what you want. All I know is that I have uh, I've gotten very cynical. Mm-hmm. about relationships and about love and about, you know, like I'm at this age, well, I'm 51, where I'm like, I don't have to do anything I don't want to do. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't have to put up with anyone's shit. Yeah. So that's sort of like... That's the, a good attitude. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's sort of where, I, like, where I'm kind of at. It's like, you know, I don't, you know, nah. Yeah. You got a lot of, you know, I got my own baggage. I get that. But you're like, mm-hmm. like, why not just have fun if that's possible? Right. What are we looking for at this point? Exactly. <laughs> like you're not looking for someone to start a whole life with. I don't think so. Yeah. I, I, you know, what are you experiencing? Um, I don't know. Well, I, I was actually out with a friend who, um, this really good writer, and she, I'm going to kind of not steal her idea, but oh, yeah. <laughs> just, she was talking about relationships and how um, she did a lot of dating be- when she moved out here and before she met her husband and she said, well, it seems like there are two kinds of, uh, people or relationships, like the first kind where, you know, they, they want to zip you up in a suit with them yeah, <laughs> together and completely intermesh your, yeah, yeah. your lives right. together. It yeah. was super con- meshed. Right. And the other kind where you kind of go in and out of each other's right. lives and you have space. Right. And um, I would definitely be more of the second leaning. Sure. You know, like I need a lot of space. Yeah, mentally, I, that sounds very good to me. But emotionally, I, I don't know. Yeah. Like, you know, whatever's gurgling up in there in terms of needs or how yeah. that's going to use me as a puppet. I don't, I'm not always quite clear. That's a big challenge. Are you a Virgo? Libra. Huh. Yeah. Almost a Virgo. You think that has a bearing on this? Possibly. Well, because like when you were talking about that, maybe thing, a rising science worker. Maybe I don't know. Like, I got to look it up. Yeah, I've had charts done, but I, I get it gets a little overwhelming. But um, like in the when you talked about projecting a fantasy on people, hmm. like that, like that whole thing, like you know, there there's some definitely like, you're definitely you know your wisdom's coming through. It's gonna hmm. <laughs> like that whole idea of like. You're you're making somebody up to fit you know what you need, mm-hmm. and then it's only a matter of time before they disappoint you. Right. That's a fucking problem. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah, I just, I've been talking about this. Book. Yeah, they do meet people who are like you don't know why they like you. Like, do they like you because? No idea. I mean, it's all part of who you are anyway. What you do, right? Whether it's right, you know, you're. So, of course, they're going to like you because of what you do. Also, that's like, it's not yeah. like. It's kind of weird. You kind of doubt it. And then you, I guess, feel like once they get to know you that maybe, I'm saying you, but I mean, you know. You, yeah. (laughs) The universal you. Right. That they won't like you or something. Or that, why would they? (laughs) 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 That's it. So do you think love's insane? (laughs) I don't, it's like there's, there's, like, I don't know, like, I've been taught over time and from, you know, bad experiences that, you know, what I experience as, what does love really mean to any one person? You know, there's, there's this intensity that happens. And there, like, you, as you get older, you can't deny the craziness of the relationships. Mm-hmm. And then I think that what's happened to me is that you, you just live with this heartbreak. It doesn't always, it doesn't disappear. It just mm-hmm. sort of fades in intensity. And, and it just, it becomes like this, weird thing that just kind of percolates there 
And and I guess you can fall in love again, but yeah, after mm. a certain point, right. like how much drama, how much yeah. bullshit you want to. That's true. But then all of a sudden you find yourself in crazy land. Yeah. Ugh. But like, it's good that you have a, a a child that's growing up nicely, and you mm-hmm. have that response. But I don't have any of that. I'm still a fucking yeah. idiot. Yeah. I mean, she's um, you know, in college now, and um. But you did that. Yeah, but I feel a little unsprung, like... Well, <laughs> what, now? Now I feel like a teenager or something. Well, are you so, meeting good people? Do you have good people to hang out with? And, yeah. And you're you're dating cool people? Um. Yeah, I mean, I'm not... I don't know. I don't know what my dating status is right, right now, but... Are you with people, like, uh, like around our, our age, or...? Mostly younger. Oh, yeah? I don't yeah? meet anyone my age. Yeah? Never. Huh. Weird. Yeah. Might not be good. Go with younger. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> you think? <laughs> That's all I mean. Younger's good. I'm glad you're doing that. It's nice to hear. Because <laughs> men always get sort of a you know, bad rap for that. Yeah. I you understand guess. now why they do it. Yeah. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you also mentioned Danny Goldberg, who I had a miserable experience with. Is he still in your life? Not a good no, I don't time. know what Danny. I think, does I think he's a manager now or something? I don't know. All I know is he came into Air America when I was a morning guy there and just fired me. Oh. And he was like this weird, kind of like confused, medicated person wandering huh. around the halls. Huh. How long and ago was that? They brought him in as CEO for reasons that I don't know. Um, that was in 2005, huh. maybe. Yeah, but he was like, he was definitely one of the villains in the uh, the Mark Marin narrative. Hmm. But, um, so, what are you going to do? you going to do art? you going to do music? Yeah, I'm probably going to, you know, do art, mostly art, but also um, do music. Do you think you'll ever uh, forgive that man? Um, I hope so. Yeah. I hope so someday. Hard, right? But, um... It's, you know, it's actually good that, you know, your daughter's all grown up and you don't have to deal with that thing of like are you mm-hmm. picking oh, her yeah. up or for well, sure yeah that well you seem good that's tough oh yeah you seem good to me thanks it's great talking to you and i appreciate you coming oh, i'm so happy to be here good i'm a huge fan of your show thank you and thank you for this book i liked it i'm almost great done. and i and now i've listened to all the uh sonic youth records what's your favorite them. sonic youth record What's well, weird because I hadn't heard um, the first one that I ever. Did, did you ever even? I didn't even know you like listen to Sonic Youth. Yeah, well, there's like it's weird when I talk to musicians mm-hmm. because I can like somebody but not listen to everything. Yeah, of course. Do you know how can you do that? Yeah. But Daydream Nation, Goo, and mm-hmm. Dirty were were like I remember when Goo came out, I bought it. I had cassette tape, mm-hmm. so I had it That's on. That's cool. Right, I had it on cassette, and I remember it, and I listened to it a lot. And then, like, you know, things happen. Mm-hmm. So those three I really was familiar with. But then, like, I never went all the way back. Mm-hmm. So I did that. And I went a little bit forward. And then I got, you know, it, it, every time I talk to a musician, I get to, like, and then, like, I, I don't know, never knew who Glenn, Glenn Bronco was. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there's plenty of people who are listening. Like, of course you did an asshole. Like, how could you <laughs> not know, like, those people? But it was great to listen to it all again and to, and to, and to talk to you. I was nervous, but I think it went good. I was afraid that you were going to... Make what? me cry. Come on. Why do people say that? <laughs> no. I, I, it's like, I mean, like, I don't. Well, I, I cry easily if I'm just in the, in the, a certain mood or something. Well, like, like I, like it, there were so, like, you made me cry this morning. You made me cry this morning. I just want you to feel like I, I, I don't, I didn't feel, did I feel like an idiot? No. Oh. All right. Thanks for talking, Kim. Sure. That's it. That's the show. I enjoyed talking to uh, Kim Gordon. I enjoyed meeting her. And um, and she was right here in my house. Go to WTFPod.com for all your WTF pod needs. And remember to visit Slack.com slash WTF to try out a great new messaging service that consolidates all the ways you communicate into one app. Go there and create a team account, and you'll get $100 in credit you can use when you decide to upgrade to a paid plan. But first... You can use Slack Lite with unlimited users for as long as you like for free. Give it a spin with your team and then get $100 in credit for upgrading just by visiting slack.com slash WTF. Theme music is by John Montagna. Other music on today's episode was uh, by DJ Copley. Check the marination dates, people.
Check those dates because uh, we added shows in Boston, uh, Toronto. Um, we added a show in Asheville. Philadelphia is pretty close to selling out. Houston is sold out. You can go to WTFPod.com slash calendar and see when I'm coming. I'm a little worn out. Still getting over a cold. I don't know what these... I can't use that box anymore because it caused trouble. What box can I use? What does that one do? 